but yeah, we're gonna we're gonna get started. You guys are kind of lighting up this world. It is a dark place. It would have been dark, and I wanted it kind of creepy with a little bit of lightning to kind of see the animals. Um, but yeah, so welcome to Noah's Ark. And and so in the Hebrew, the name Noah or Noah, it comes from the word meaning to rest. And so Noah was actually the 10th generation from Adam. And so he was born about 600 years before this catastrophe happens, this flood. And he was, all, he was known for being righteous and blameless, someone who walked closely with God. So you want to study his character. But then again, you'll see, we won't get into it, but after this, he kind of falls into some stuff. But back in Noah's day, people lived way longer than we do today and so adam and eve were originally created to live forever but sin brought death into this world as as you know and so adam lived to 930 years old you, you would think you'd probably start running out of stuff to do when you're like 200 years old like i kind of seen it all man but in, in no way even he actually even lived longer than that he lived to 950 years and so when when noah was actually born his father named him with the hope he will comfort us in the labor and painful toil of our hands caused by the ground the lord has cursed in genesis 5:29. and so basically just to get into some stuff off way before we before we start that's kind of controversial is before this flood genesis genesis introduces the sons of god and you guys can look up this stuff later if you want to find human women attractive and it's so it's hinting at other divine beings these sons of god marry human women a theme in many ancient stories in response god limits humans lifespan to 120 years using the name Yahweh the Lord and so from these unions come these creatures called Nephilim and they're part divine beings described as heroes of old warriors of renown the term Nephilim means fallen in Hebrew and so it appears that maybe and, and I, we all don't know that they may have been fallen angels who intermingled with the human women and some crazy stuff but um and so it says, as the flood story unfolds, we learn that the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was so great on earth that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually in Genesis 6-5. So, I mean, it's just nonstop evil, 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 evil. And it's just, imagine growing up in a place like that. Like, I don't have kids, and I can't imagine, you know, this world is going to kind of crazy like that. And, and it's... And it's ways too and this grieved god to his heart while the bible doesn't state exactly how long it took noah to build this ark that we're in genesis 6 3 suggests that god gave humanity 120 years to repent before judgment before he floods the place and so many believe this refers to a time leading up to the flood during which noah likely spent decades constructing the ark and warning who was preaching to a sinful generation that just didn't want to hear this stuff like just doing this right now is not very popular unless you're a mega church pastor that talks about giving all the time and so it's estimated that building the ark took anywhere from 80 to 120 years and so noah looked pretty crazy i felt kind of crazy building this myself honestly i did i'm like in here in the dark building this and i kind of felt like noah probably would have felt like why am i doing this but when god wants you to do something you just do it and so we'll go ahead and um i have this <laughs> it'll be a little different later but if you kind of come close to here a scripture should pop up i don't know if you guys see it as you walk closer like this purple scripture pops up you got to get close to it i'm going to go ahead and read it there um just for the live stream's sake and who knows i don't know if they'll be able to see it or not but um because if someone else reads they may not be able to hear it it says in genesis 7 1 7 the lord then said to Noah, go into the ark in your whole family because i have found you righteous in this generation and take with you seven pairs of every kind of clean animal a male and its mate and one pair of every kind of unclean animal a male and its mate and also seven pairs of every kind of bird male and female to keep their various kinds alive throughout the earth 
and seven days from now I will send rain on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. Now that's a lot of rain. And I will wipe from the face of the earth every living creature I have made. And Noah did all that the Lord commanded him. And so Noah was 600 years old. Remember, he lived like the 950 or something like that. When the flood waters came on the earth, and Noah and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives entered the ark to escape the waters of the flood, and pairs of clean and unclean animals, of birds and of all creatures that move along the ground, male and female, came to Noah and entered the ark as God has commanded Noah. And after seven days, the flood waters came on the earth. And so, here. But yeah, so these scriptures are kind of interesting how they're laid out. Sorry, I'm kind of a little rusty in VR. I'm trying to like turn right. So, so in verse 1 there, if, if you guys still see it, and if you don't see the scripture, you can walk forward, it pops up. It says, The Lord then said to Noah, Go into the ark, you and your whole family, because I have found you righteous in this generation. And so the Hebrew word bow can mean either come or go. And come into the ark, it feels fitting here, as it reflects God's offering of shelter and security during this huge trial on the earth where he's going to flood it. And so the idea is, and this is abstract, but it's true, is that God was already in the ark and would be there with Noah, inviting him to join him inside. And then in verse 2... <clears throat> It says, take with you seven pairs of every kind of clean animal, a male and its mate, and one pair of every kind of unclean animal, a male and its mate. And so, and so in Hebrew, and, and Pastor David would know, he, he was in here, the clean animals Noah was to bring are described as seven sevens. And so some interpret this as seven pairs, 14 total, but a better understanding is three pairs plus one extra. And so this extra animal wasn't for appetizers. It wasn't like on the dinner menu. As we see later in chapter 8, Noah used some of these clean animals for burnt offerings on the altar. <clears throat> and then in verse 4 behind me, it says, Seven days from now, I will send rain on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. That's a lot of rain. You've seen some of this flooding that's been going on. And it's just like a day of rain or, or a couple of days. And I will wipe from the face of the earth every living creature I have made. So in the Bible, <clears throat> if you're into like, you know, biblical numerology or whatever, the, the number seven often symbolizes completion or perfection. And so Genesis describes God creating the heavens and earth in six days, and then he rests on the seventh day. And so the number 40 also appears frequently in the Bible, often connected to judgment or testing, leading many scholars to see it as a symbol of a trial or a probation. For example, Moses spent 40 days and 40 nights on Mount Sinai without food or water. Now, I recommend you wouldn't do this fast because that's some supernatural stuff. <laughs> you would die. And Goliath challenged Israel for 40 days before David's victory. And Elijah, he traveled 40 days to Mount Horeb fleeing from Queen Jezebel. And Jonah warned Nineveh of destruction in 40 days. And Jesus, as you all know, was tempted for 40 days. And he ascended 40 days after resurrection. And so the signif significance of 40 is often de debated, but it's reoccurring. And it, I think its use is definitely interesting. And so we're going to head over to this next scene here, if you guys follow me. I know it's dark, um, but if you got a headlamp, feel free to use it. <laughs> So I'm over here by the giraffe, and like I said, these scriptures, I'm going to tweak them later where people kind of know to come towards them, and it'll pop up. And feel free just, you know, just to, uh, I'm on megaphone to explore. So I'm going to read this next scripture, um, <clears throat> Genesis 7, 7, 24. It says, pairs of clean and unclean animals of birds and of all creatures that move along the ground, male and female, came to Noah, and they entered the ark. So they, they came to him. I don't know if that was supernaturally. They just showed up. People dropped them off. I don't 
No. And so as God had commanded Noah, and after seven days the flood waters came on the earth. And so in the 1600th year of Noah's life, on the 17th day of the second month, on that day all the springs of the great deep burst forth, and the floodgates of the heavens were opened, and rain fell on the earth forty days and forty nights, and on that very day Noah and his son Shem, Ham, and Japheth, now, if anyone's named Ham, you, you might want to question that. I'm just joking. Together with his wife and the wives of his three sons entered the ark. And they had with them every wild animal according to its kind. All livestock according to their kinds. Every creature that moves along the ground according to its kind. And every bird according to its kind. Everything with wings. Pairs of all creatures that have the breath of life in them came to Noah and entered the ark and the animals were going in were male and female of every living thing and as God had commanded Noah a lot of scripture but it'll get tied in at the end and then the Lord shut him in <laughs> I love that part then the Lord shut him in for 40 days the flood kept coming on the earth and as the waters increased they lifted the ark high above the earth and the waters rose and increased greatly on the earth and the ark floated on the surface of the water they rose greatly on the earth and all the high mountains under the entire heavens were covered and the waters rose and covered the mountains to a depth of more than 15 cubits that's like some serious flooding and every living thing that moved on land perished birds livestock wild animals all the creatures that swarm over the earth and all mankind everything on dry land had the breath of life in it well something got cut off anyway so it says in verse 11 behind me there that says in the 1600th year of noah's life da 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 on that day all the springs of the great deep burst forth and the floodgates of heaven were open and so it's interesting because when you hear this the windows of heaven were open and so in Noah's time the flood waters came from two sources the fountains of the great deep and the windows of he heaven Genesis 7 7 11 and after 40 days these waters stopped as the fountains of the deep and the windows of heavens were closed and so in the Bible these windows of heaven often represent God's connection and interaction with people on the earth so he can turn this thing on and off and when Jesus came up from the water, the heavens were actually open, and the Spirit of God descended on him with a voice declaring, This is my beloved Son, who brings me great joy. It's God who controls the opening and closing of heaven's windows. And so, in verse 16 behind me, it says, The animals going in were male and female of every living kind. And then it said, God has commanded Noah, and then the Lord shut him in. <laughs> so, what does that mean? When God shuts the door of the ark, after that door was closed, this is, I know everyone's heard this, I didn't grow up as a Christian, so I didn't go to, like, Bible school and heard the watered-down version of the story. But after that door was closed, it was time for judgment. And the only... And only those inside were saved, and so no one else could come in. God shut him in, and the ark represents how we find salvation in Jesus, who called himself the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved, John 10, 9. And there are moments when God puts us in similar situation, situations, isolate, isolating us from our, our usual activities or shutting the door so to make his path clear, because he's in control of everything. So he was shut in there. It had to be kind of scary, cause, and, and I mentioned this on that YouTube short, that if you go in this boat, there's no captain's quarters. There's no wheel. There's no place for, like, a captain to steer this thing. You're basically going into this. It'd be like going into a car with no, no steering wheel, no driver. You know what I mean? It, it's like God supernaturally... The captain of this ship and you you gotta trust like i don't know what's gonna happen in this thing but god's protecting us and so it's interesting to think about because uh, i've been thinking about that lately just to be in this scenario um so in verse 22 i believe is behind me or it's not but i'll read it anyway it said everything on dry land that had breath of the life in its nostrils died 
and every and every living thing on the face of the earth was wiped out. And people, animals, and creatures that move along the ground and birds were wiped from the earth. And only Noah was left, and those with him in the ark. And so, I don't know why that got deleted, but it did. But it's verse 22. And this verse highlights the end of God's judgment on a sinful world. This place was a sinful place where God's just like, I'm going to wipe it out. It had to be pretty bad if it's to that degree. And so earlier in Genesis, we see the violence and corruption that made God regret creating humans. <clears throat> and it led him to decide to wipe them out. And so this flood was a response to this wickedness, reminding us of the consequences of turning away from God. And you'll see this in the media lately. It's, not, it's nothing new. Like everything you see now is like so ungodly. And, and I wouldn't be surprised in a couple of years, like if the Bible is like some foreign thing where like people don't even read it anymore. And so it shows God's holiness, justice, and control over creation. And Genesis 2, 7, 9 tells us that God created man from dust and he gave him life. Sadly, everyone and everything outside the ark during this time perished. The fish in the sea and the sea life they were not at risk. They were underwater, so I guess maybe fly fishing was an option. But Noah was different from everyone else in this time. <clears throat> Just six chapters into the Bible, the, the world is already full of violence or Hamas and corruption. And God decided to wipe out humanity, except for Noah and his family. And so these eight people would be saved miraculously through the ark God had instructed Noah to build. And like I said, there's no captain's quarters. There's no one driving this thing. It's not like getting on the bus when you're a kid and there's the bus drivers up front like, hey, let's go. There's no one in here. It'd be like hopping on a plane with no pilot. And you're just like, where are we going? You just gotta trust God. And so, um, definitely missing some scriptures, but let's head over to the next scene. <laughs> We're going to go upstairs a couple levels if you want to follow me. So I'm heading upstairs, if y'all can hear me, <clears throat> to the very, very top level. There'll be a fox in the window, which has nothing to do with this verse, but it sounds cool. And it's actually, I'll let you guys come up here and you'll see where I'm at. All right, I got. I love that Pastor David's a donkey. He fits right in here. I got a VIP a VIP stable for him for sure. Is this lighting wouldn't wouldn't be done without him? And so, I'm gonna go ahead and read. <clears throat> I was missing some scriptures on that last this one, but hey. So Genesis eight one nine. I know it's a lot, but we'll be almost done here soon. But God remember Noah and all the wild animals and the livestock that were with him in the ark. And he sent a wind over the earth and the waters, <coughs> excuse me, receded. Now the springs of the deep and the floodgates of heavens that we talked about had been closed and the rain had stopped falling from the sky and the water receded steadily from the earth. And at the end of 150 days, the water had gone down. And on the seventeenth day of the seventh month, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. The waters continued to recede until the tenth month, and on the first day of the tenth month, the top of the mountains became visible. And after forty days, Noah opened a window he had made in the ark. There wasn't a fox by it, but we'll just pretend. And he sent out a raven. And it kept flying back and forth until the water had dried up from the earth. And then he sent out a dove to see if the water had receded from the surface of the ground. But the dove could find no place to set its feet because there was water over all the surface of the earth. So it returned to Noah in the ark and he reached out his hand and took the dove and brought it back to himself in the ark. So he sent out one raven and he sent out one dove. And so it says behind me he sent over a wind over the earth and the waters were seen. and so god also sends a strong wind to help evaporate this water he's in control of everything and it says god sent a wind over the earth to push back the waters and so the hebrew word for wind here is ruach and it's often you know the definition of that is spirit and so in john 3 4 8 nicodemus asks 
how can someone be born when they are old? Surely they can't, they can't enter their mother's womb again. And Jesus replies, Verily, truly, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. Don't be surprised that I said you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it wants. You hear it, but you can't tell where it comes from or where it's going. And that's how it is with everyone born of the Spirit. And in verse 4 behind me, <clears throat> excuse me, I should have drank some water. And on the 17th, 17th day of the seventh month, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. And so the Mount Ararat is in, in northeastern Turkey. And it has seen many expeditions, you know, basically since the 1800s, not to turn into the Discovery Channel right now, all hoping to find this Noah's Ark. It's like the Ark of the Covenant. They're trying to find this thing. It's a young volcano, and it's in an unstable area. It's making it tough to spot. It's making it basically a tough spot to leave the Ark. So being at a high altitude in, in a mountainous region would make it hard for everyone and everything inside to get out. But if God wanted the ark to be preserved for thousands of years, then it actually would be a great choice. But they end up high up on this mountain with all the animals. And let me see if 6 is behind me. And verse 6 says, After 40 days, Noah opened a window he had made in the ark, and he sent out a raven. It wasn't a fox, it was a raven. I couldn't find one. And it kept flying back and forth until the waters had dried up from the earth. And so unlike this white dove... The raven is a blackbird, and it's considered an unclean animal during this time. And in Scripture, Leviticus 11, 13, 15 says, These are the birds you are to detest and not eat, the eagle, the vulture, the black vulture, and any kind of raven. So, I've never had raven tacos, and I don't think it's a trend yet. But ravens are scavengers and feeding mainly on decaying, decaying flesh. And so this passage also mentions a window in the ark's upper section, which Noah could open and close. So when he sent out a raven, it didn't return. And sailors, this is very common, often use this practice to find land. If a bird came back, it hadn't found a place to rest. And ravens, however, could land on and feed from floating remains. So, you know, it didn't return. It, it's likely found someone you know, found somewhere to settle. And so doves, on the other hand, would come back if they didn't find land close by. So take a note how the raven is, it is described here. I think it's interesting. It may not mean anything. The scripture says the raven went back and forth and didn't return. It kind of reminds you of anyone else in scripture who is also described as roaming the earth to and fro. And this raven was also sent out once and the dove was sent out three times. And so I think I got verse 8 behind me. Verse 8 says, then he sent out a dove. So got the raven. Now we're going to the dove. Number one, then he sent out the dove to see if the water had receded from the surface of the ground. But the dove could find no place to set its feet because there was water over all the surface of the earth. So it returned to Noah in the ark. And so after seven days, <clears throat> Noah sends out a dove which soon returns. And in the Old Testament, especially in Leviticus, there are specific times when two doves or young pigeons are used for sacrifices like guilt offerings or purification after certain event, events such as childbirth. And by Jesus' time, the dove has become a powerful symbol representing Israel, atonement, suffering, a sign from God, fertility, and even the Spirit of God. And so in Levit Leviticus 5-7 we read, But if he cannot afford a lamb, then he shall bring to the Lord as his con compensation for the sin that he has committed two turtle doves or two pigeons, one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering. <clears throat> so we'll head over to the next scene. I, I'm trying to figure out where I'm... Just give me one second to get my bearings. Uh, guys, see any chickens anywhere? The chickens are this way, so follow me over here. If you go past the chickens here, watch out. There are some uh, pigeons. And if you want to read the scripture, um, you just if you get closer to me, this purple scripture will pop up. Um, but I'm going to read it. I know it's a lot of scripture, but we're getting close to the end. And, and the reason I found this scene was 
because my note said chicken. So anyway, I'm going to go ahead and read this. It says, <clears throat> he waited seven more days. So remember, he sent the raven out. He sent the, the first dove. Now he waited seven more days and again sent out the dove from the ark. And when the dove returned to him in the evening, there in its beak was a freshly plucked olive leaf. So cool. And then Noah knew that the water had receded from the earth. And he waited seven more days. The seven is means perfection. And he sent the dove out again. But this time it did not return to him. And so by the first day of the first month in Noah's 601st year, the water had dried up from the earth. And Noah then removed the covering from the ark and saw that the surface of the ground was dry. And by the 27th day of the second month, the earth was completely dry. And then God said to Noah, Come out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and their wives. Bring out every kind of living creature that is with you, the birds, the animals, and all the creatures that move along the ground so they can multiply on the earth and be fruitful and increase in number on it. And so Noah... Noah came out together with his sons and his wife and his son's wives and all the animals and all the creatures that move along the ground and all the birds and everything that moves on the land came out of the ark, one kind after another. Now this is on top of a mountaintop, so it had to be kind of sketchy. Then Noah built an altar. <clears throat> That's why we played that song. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and, and taking some of all the clean animals and clean birds, he sacrificed burnt offerings on it and the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma and he said in his heart never again will I curse the ground because of humans even though every inclination of the human heart is evil from childhood and never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done as long as the earth endures sea time and heavens cold and heat summer and winter day and night will never cease and this story is amazing <clears throat> so it says in verse 1, I believe, I hope I'm on the right one here. Hey, one second, sorry. Sorry, I'm getting a little sidetracked here. Well, anyway, I'm going to I'm gonna roll with it. <laughs> I think I'm definitely getting off. But it says God. It said that. Um, but God remembered Noah. And the English word "remember" it can sound like something was forgotten in the English term. But in the Hebrew word, it means something different. It's about being faithful to a covenant. And so when the Bible says God remembered, it shows he's acting in line with promises he made. And so whenever God remembered people in the Old Testament. It meant he stepped in to save them, usually from death, infertility, or slavery. And in Matthew 26, 26 through 28, during the Last Supper, Jesus took the bread and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup and said, Drink from it, all of you. This is the blood of the covenant poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And so, and I believe verse 10 is behind me. Yeah, it is. It says he waited seven more days, and back to the doves, I'm sorry. Again, he sent out the dove from the ark. When the dove returned to him in the evening, there in its beak was a freshly plucked olive leaf. So again, he sends out a raven. Dove number one. Dove number two comes back with an olive leaf. And so the, ra the raven never came back, but the, this dove returned with proof of life, a small olive leaf. And we aren't told how Noah reacted, I'm sure he's pretty excited about it because I would be super claustrophobic in here and it was like that way when I was building it until um, Pastor David helped me with the lighting and even it made it scarier in here. I'm just joking. But um, after almost a year in the ark, the sign of life outside must have been powerful. And so this olive branch became a symbol for Israel from the early days of the temple in its design and representing the nation itself with God as the farmer. And so olive oil from the olive tree is used in holy anointing, and it represents the Holy Spirit. And Paul used the cultivated olive tree to represent Israel in a wild olive tree or shoot for Gentile believers like myself. And God preserved Israel's holy root while pruning off unworthy branches. And the name 
Gethsemane, which I'm, I'm butchering, I know I am, means all of press. And it was here when Jesus felt the weight of the world's sin on him, and in his agony, his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground in Luke 22, 44. That area was called all of press, the definition of it. And he waited seven more days, it says in verse 12, and he sent the dove out again. This is the third time. <clears throat> but this time it did not return to him, so that's good news. And so the dove's departure was proof that earth was ready to live on again. And over 21 days, excuse me, <clears throat> Noah sent out both the raven and the dove after the mountaintops became visible. And the raven was his first attempt to find dry land, but the dove was his way of knowing when it was safe to leave this ark. Because I'm sure it smelled... And I'm sure they are claustrophobic in here. And this time the dove didn't return, so that's good news. And have you ever seen a dove fly down and rest on someone? Like a parrot? <laughs> I haven't. But when Jesus was baptized, the Holy Spirit came down like a dove and it stayed with him. John describes it like this. John 1, 32-33. Then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him and i myself did not know him but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me and the man on whom you see the spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the holy spirit and so we see if 17 is behind me and then verse 17 it says bring out every living creature that is with you the birds the animals all the creatures that move along the ground so they can multiply on the earth and be fruitful and increase in number. So God told, like you saw those animals down there in the bottom, God told Noah to bring out every living creature from the ark, just as they were once brought in. And it seems that all the animals survived their year on the ark. You don't hear of them dying. <clears throat> this story wouldn't be very popular in nurseries if it's just a bunch of dead animals painted on a wall, because it doesn't talk about the animals dying. And then the most important part is verse 20. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord, and taking some of all the clean animals and clean birds, he sacrificed burnt offerings on it. And the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, and he said in his heart, Never again will I curse the ground because of humans, and even through every inclination of human heart is evil from childhood, and never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done. As long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, will never cease. So right after leaving the ark, <clears throat> he doesn't like, you know, make, make a sandwich go exploring, take a shower. Right after leaving the ark, Noah's first action was to build an altar. And in Matthew 6.33 says, But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. I know that's true. <laughs> that's my favorite verse, because it's true. If you seek first the kingdom of God first, all the other stuff that, that you want, God knows what you want and what you need, will be given to you as well. And he offered burnt sacrifices from every clean animal and the bird he brought with them. And he understood that the entire earth has been judged and cleansed by God, leaving nothing pure or acceptable in its natural state. And the aroma of these offerings please God. So in the New, Test in the New Testament, <clears throat> sorry about my, my throat, I sound like I'm a smoker and I'm not. I do like a, c a cigar occasionally and I'll promote those. In the New Testament, we see that Christ is the one who truly pleases the Father. In Hebrews 13, 15, it says, Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess His name. And then... Let's head over to the next scene. Sorry, guys. Let's <laughs> get a little sidetracked there. And follow me. We'll head over to the other side of the boat. Um, this is where Noah and the gang's bedrooms are. So 
so behind me, I'm going to go ahead and read this scripture. And then we got one more, and then we'll close out. And it says in Genesis 9, 1, 7, Then God blessed Noah and his sons, saying to them, Be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. The fear and dread of you will fall on all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and on every creature that moves along the ground and on all the fish in the sea. They are forgiven into your hands. Everything that lives and moves about will be food for you. Just as I gave you the green plants, I give you everything. But you must not eat meat that has its lifeblood still in it. And if you are in for your lifeblood, I, I sh will surely demand an accounting. I will demand an accounting from every animal and from each human being too. I will demand an accounting for the life of another human being. Whoever sheds human blood... By humans shall their blood be shed, for in the image of God has God made mankind. That's deep. So your enemies are made in the image of God. As for you, be fruitful and increase in number, multiply on the earth and increase upon it. And so it says that God... It said that God blessed... I don't know why I keep backing up <laughs> going forward. It said, Then God blessed Noah and his son, saying to them, Be fruitful, increase in number, and fill the earth. And this scene kind of reminds me of creation. God instructed Noah and his family to go out, be fruitful, and multiply, and refill the earth, because he just wiped the place out. Be fruitful and multiply. And God allowed them to eat green plants and for the first time the meat of the animals though he forbade eating blood. And in Genesis 1.28, replenish the earth means fill it with life. A command to populate the world. Because from this lineage will come the Messiah. And Adam and Eve were blessed to fill, work, and care for the earth. Now Noah and his family receive the same blessings. <clears throat> excuse me. To be fruitful and multiply as the new beginning of humanity. And in verse 5 behind me it says, And for your lifeblood I will surely demand an accounting. I will demand an accounting from every animal and from every human being too. I will demand an accounting for the life of another human being. Whoever sheds human blood by humans shall their blood be shed for in the image of God has God made mankind. That's deep. God also established the death penalty here for murder, emphasizing that every human's life is precious because were made in God's image. So when I'm judging someone that's not a believer or judging someone's being a jerk to me, they're actually created in God's image. They just don't know their creator. And whoever sheds man's blood by man, his blood shall be shed for the image of God he made man. And so this passage reminds us to see others as created in the image and likeness of God. And so, so by this Everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another, John 13, 35 says. And let's head outside and we'll wrap this thing up. Let me find the door here. I know it's kind of dark. <clears throat> I'll go ahead and read this one. I usually have other people read, but I just don't know if it'll come on the live stream here. And it says on Genesis 9, 8, 17, Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, I now establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you and with every living creature that was with you, the birds, the livestock, and all the wild animals, all those that came out of the ark with you, every living creature on earth, I establish my covenant with you. Never again will all life be destroyed by the waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. <clears throat> and God said, this is the sign of the covenant I am making between me and you and every living creature with you, a covenant for all generations to come. I have set my rainbow in the clouds. That's God's sign. He created that. It's not a logo for anything else. I've set my rainbow in the clouds, and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Whenever I bring clouds over the earth and the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will remember my covenant between me and you and all living creatures of every kind. Never again will the waters become a flood to destroy all life. Whenever the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God 
and all living creatures of every kind on the earth. So God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant <clears throat> I have established between me and all life on earth. So it's amazing. So when I see a rainbow, I remember that promise there. I mean, that God created that. And it's deep. And, and the rainbow is a sign of God's mercy and grace. And interestingly, the Hebrew word for rainbow actually means war bow. And when God placed the bow in the clouds, he told Noah, when I see it, I will remember the everlasting covenant. And what's unique about this covenant is, is that it's entirely one-sided. Like, it's just one-sided. He's it it just like, God makes a promise to Noah without asking for anything in return. And so this promise isn't just with Noah and his descendants, but it's with every creature on earth. So next time you see a storm... Look for the r r rainbow as a reminder of God's promise. And so God makes a promise to Noah and all living creatures that despite human failings, he's never going to flood again this earth. Instead, he will preserve us as he works towards reaching humanity and creation through the offspring of a woman. And in the new covenant... We're given forgiveness in God's spirit to help us live with love and purpose. And because of Jesus... We can live righteously and join him, join him in renewing this world. And so the Old Covenant required strict obedience to the law and sacrifices for sin. And those were God's covenants at the time. But now salvation is a free gift. It's like this rainbow deal. It's one-sided. You don't have to do anything. You don't deserve it. And to receive this gift, all you got to do is just say this prayer and believe it in your heart. <clears throat> The prayer is nothing magical. I did it. And I, I wasn't even reading the Bible at the time. And I became a new creation. And I can tell you, God is amazing. And my life has forever been changed. I'm not perfect. Because we all know what happens after this scene. Noah plants a vineyard. He gets drunk. He gets naked. And I don't want to ruin the story for you. But God uses people that are flawed. Jesus is the only one perfect. So if you're going to come to a church service and pretend you're the perfect Christian, you're not. Because we're all flawed. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to judge people. We're going to do stupid stuff. But because of Jesus' sacrifice, our sins are forgiven. And he's perfect. And he, la he lived a perfect life. He was blameless, much like Noah in his time. And who knows what the standards of Noah was, because everyone could have been like murderers, and he's like, I didn't kill anyone yet. You're perfect. You're, well, I can use you. And so if you want to say this prayer, if you're online right now watching this, you repeat this prayer. Jesus, I know I'm a sinner, and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins, and you rose from the dead. I turn from my sins and I invite you to come into my heart and life. I want to trust and follow you as my Lord and Savior.